What would you say from your personal experience has been one of the, the most consistent issues that you see plaguing young men and holding them back from all your years of experience? Well, one of them is um, wrong attitude towards education. Mm. And, you know, because it's, it's easy. And I, like I said, temperamentally, I was disinclined to enjoy school, especially from grade 7 through grade 12, especially Why do you junior say that? high. Well, all my friends were kind of delinquent types in some ways, and so they acted up, and so did I, and I was pretty mouthy. But also, it was too slow for me. You know, like if when, when I took language arts in grade 8, I had read the whole year's books in the first, I think it was the first day, but it was certainly the first week. And so mm. it just bored me. I was just bored to death. So that wasn't so good. Um, and, you know, there, it can be a bit infantilizing because of the rule structure. Like I said, a lot of my friends, they just weren't going to put up their hand when they wanted to go to the bathroom anymore. And they were just done with that. And, but one of the things young men aren't taught properly, and I mean even at the age of, let's say, 11, young, is like, there is nothing that will make you more powerful than your words. And so if you think that reading and writing is for pansies and dimwits, you know, or teachers' pets, because they get in less trouble in school, let's say, you're seriously misinformed. And so, you know, I talk to people like Jocko Willink, and Jocko's as tough a guy as you could ever hope to encounter about literacy, and a number of other people, too, who are also seriously tough guys. Um, Congressman Dan... Dan Crenshaw. Crenshaw, yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, he's as tough as a bloody boot, that guy, you know, and, 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 and both those characters, and Rex Murphy, who's one of Canada's outstanding journalists, another, he's so damn tough, it's crazy, and they all know perfectly well that literacy is a huge part of what's made them unstoppable. And you don't take that lightly. You know, it's really serious. And it's a failing of our education system that it's not, that literacy isn't marketed properly to young men. It's like, straighten up, speak properly, write, learn to write. Why? Because that's the same as learning to think. And why should you think? Mm. Well, because you won't do as many stupid things and your horizons will widen. And then too, when you need to entice people along your journey, hopefully somewhere good, you'll be able to do it because you'll be compelling. And it's, there's something deeply pathological about the way our society markets literacy to young men in particular, because while well, partly we just won't allow for the let's say the marketing association between toughness and dangerousness and literacy. It, there's mm. something wrong about that, we think, some weird way, and it's just, it's, that's wrong. It's like, sure, you should be physically tough, and you should be tough in your temperament, as well as having the capacity for play and compassion. You know, that has to be developed too. But that's not enough. And I don't care how tough you are physically, you're nowhere near as tough as you would be if you were physically tough and really literate.
and then you're you're an unstoppable force and hopefully for for good and that's a much tougher battle than you know being tough for your own idiotic selfish ends that's just pathetic and so and i just don't understand where we've developed a writing program which is called essay which teaches people how to write while they use it it's a word process but it teaches people how to write as you use it we built that into the program itself and i really want to market it to young men and say look you know get your words together and then see what you can do and don't be thinking that that's somehow beneath you that just means you're stupid that you think that you don't know anything you think that it's wrong and you're limiting yourself so much you can't even imagine it. You might not even figure it out till you're 60 or, and then it's too late. So read, write, think, write. That's, that's what we need. We got together with the woman who was going to become my wife, Tammy. I mean, I've known her since we were eight and she was a friend of mine when I was a kid. And so we've known each other forever, but we got together seriously when we were in our late 20s and she was really ready to have a family, like now. And I didn't have a permanent job at that point, although my, you know, my prospects were good, which is part of the reason she married me. And, <laughs> and, but she wanted to start and I thought, okay, so why don't, I didn't really want to do that. And I thought, okay, what's your problem, Jordan? What, what is it that you're worried about? And I thought, well, there's an economic issue that that's not really serious I'll, I'll get a job and she'll come along wherever I go if I have that job so that's not an issue so, so what then well babies what the hell do I do know about babies nothing I can't take care of a baby I don't know how to do that so I said to her well the reason I seem to be objecting is because I'm kind of doubtful about the infant stage like toddlers I know what to do with them I can play with kids but when they're under a year they're like a foreign object to me in many ways. I don't, I don't know what to do, and so that worries me. And so I'll tell you what, if you'll take primary care for the infant, I'll take care of you and the infant. And <laughs> how would that be? And, and I think that's the right role. I really do believe that. And you might think, well, that's sexist. It's like, well, no, not necessarily. How are you so sure that that first year...
As a mother, isn't one of the great parts of the fundamental adventure of being female? Like, so don't, don't give me any crap about that being sexist. That's just, I don't think so. You know, and so what I would do is watch my wife and if she got tired, spell her off. And I did what I could to take care of the infant, but I knew that, you know, she would take care of that while I stumbled around trying to learn how. And she did that, and that worked fine. And then, you know, as the kids got older, I took more and more responsibility for them. And when my daughter was about two and a half, I think that's right, one and a half, we had our second child. And then I, I took care of Michaela, the older child, quite a lot after that, because Tammy, of course, was busy, especially that first year with the infant, with Julian. But that worked well. That was a good division of labor as far as I was concerned. And also my wife was very happy about that because she loved to take care of infants and that's characteristic of a lot of women you know and even those that don't admit it and it's too bad they don't yeah. admit it because what there's something wrong with that is there some i saw this tweet the other day about this whoop, grandmother mother of a you know a mature daughter and the daughter had announced that she was never going to have kids and the, the her mother said oh i think that's just great you know you're gonna you're gonna just live for you and that's just wonderful and i'm glad you can be so independent and i thought how could you possibly say something that stupid to your daughter it's like you don't want grandchildren and and you're you're so you're so sure that she's just not ideologically addled about the fundamental realities and 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 beauties and depth of life it's like how many things do we do we have a career if we're lucky or a job if we don't if we're not we have an intimate relationship we have a family that's life man you miss one of those it's yeah. well you can do it but it's it's a big deal not to do that you know you you think that the pleasures that wealth can bring you as a uh, as a solitary and free individual outweigh the terrible you know burdensome responsibility of a family but if you're just if you're just thinking of that responsibility as burdensome you're you're not thinking straight it's like no no you don't understand that's a wonderful opportunity that's what that is and it comes at a cost like all opportunity and you see that too one of the saddest things i saw fairly regularly as a clinician was you know couples that had decided too late that they wanted to have kids and then you know were just turning themselves inside out with
with attempts to become, to conceive and often failing. And Jesus, you know, that's hard to recover from once you realize that's what you want and it doesn't happen. So don't, and the other thing that people don't really realize is that your things go by pretty quick. You know, that, that period of time when your kids are little, it seems like a long time when you think about it beforehand and even sometimes when you're living through it, but it's gone and you want to, you want to, take advantage of that and I had a great career and I still do but I can't say that it was more important to me like existentially than my family like I've had a I couldn't have possibly imagined having a career that was more what would you say it offered me everything I could have possibly wanted also a lot of trouble but but <laughs> but nonetheless and so I was exceptionally fortunate in that regard but nonetheless if I had to pick like I pick my family yeah because of the quality of the experience you know that I'm not just saying that out of a sense of obligation or duty it's like no it fundamentally that was that was deeper and I tried to teach the deepest things I could conceptualize and and succeeded in that at least to, to the degree that I could conceptualize them but still you know it's like no no when push comes to shove especially those years I spent with Tammy in Boston when our kids were little it's like man there is something to that don't miss it stupid guys don't miss that One thing my dad did for me, and my mom played a role in this, but it's, it's harder to say exactly what it was. My relationship with my mother was much easier. She's, a, she's, a, she's an easy person to get along with, an easy person to love. She also has a great sense of humor, so I could always make her laugh, and that was wonderful. And, but my dad had extremely high standards, and it was difficult to please. And so I had this strange sense from him that I could do that he was confident that I could do anything, but that nothing I did was ever quite good enough. And mm. so there's a roughness to that, you know, but there's, there's also an advantage. And it's a tough one because when you love your kids, eh, there's two things you do for them. One's more maternal, I would say, and one's more paternal. Although either parent could play them. Never really notice what you want With you I don't ever feel calm I can feel the sweat inside my palms Play with me like cats and a string You don't understand the pain it brings You don't ever wanna give me wings You don't ever wanna set me free You know I'm addicted to you And it's twisted you've been gifted with the evil voodoo Got me coming back for more even when I've been screwed Dolls full of pins, pierce my heart straight through Got issues in my head I like you in my bed But you keep me on red Oh, everything is like a test I better not text or I'll come off desperate But if I lay down and I play dead And I stay dead Baby, you'll get sick of being the monster Out of my head, under my bed Think you're something out of my head Play dead, will you regret everything that you did, that you said I don't think you understand what you're doing And my heart's black and blue from the bruising I feel like when I'm with you I'm losing I feel like you think that this amusing Sitting there gaslighting and confusing Was it me, is it me, am I deluded? I'm the one who's always sorry, the conclusion Even though I offer all of the solutions I wish you loved me like I love you, it's stupid When I'm alone with you, I never feel lucid I wish I wasn't struck by Cupid I wish when I first saw you, I knew this When I'm with you, I feel so useless I feel diluted, my heart's been wounded Silhouettes of you are like a time Never really noticed what you want 
With you, I don't ever feel calm. I could feel the sweat inside my palm. Play with me like cats and a string. You don't understand the pain it brings. You don't ever wanna give me wings. You don't ever wanna set me free. But if I lay down and I play dead and I stay dead, maybe you'll get sick of being a monster out of my head, under my bed. Think you're something out of my nightmares. See me right there. But if I lay down and I play dead and I stay dead, then will you get bored of killing me? Raw. The maternal is love. You know, it's like, I love you just the way you are. I think you're great. And that's what you have for babies. And, and you know, and it, that's the kind of love that makes you always welcome at home in some sense, no matter what you've done. But the paternal love is sort of like, I love you, but there could be more to you. And so it's in its best form, it's encouragement. And to know someone has your back, and I've always known that my parents had my back. And it's a big deal. And, you know, part of what I see that affects me so profoundly emotionally when I go lecture, for example, is I see so many young people who don't have that, you know, who've never really heard a word of encouragement. And God, that's such a lack. It's, and that's so, I, I was so fortunate in that.